Hey everybody, what's going on? It's uh, about 11.28 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The date is said to be 7-19-21. July. And um, who knows? We'll see what we're looking at. I guess I'll just call this, let's consider Luke. Now I'd like to start out with a question. Is the Bible holy? Because what they've done is some men that we don't know in a time that we are not all that familiar with, really, put together 66 books. That's right, 60 six books as the official canon of the Bible. These include 39 books in what is called the Old Testament and 27 books in what is called the New Testament. Um, if you're into numerology, and I really don't know much of anything about numerology, why, why the numbers are used the way they are in numerology, but our good friends, especially the ones who study them some Talmud, they really are into numerology. They're the ones who conceived of, or if not conceived of, certainly popularized, Gematria. So, you know, with 39 books in the Old Testament, it's divisible by 3, 13 times. And with 27 books in the New Testament, it's divisible by 3, 9 times. <clears throat> now, there's something that I think is a worthwhile endeavor. Because if we don't endeavor to at least examine these things critically, it's just religion. We're just practicing religion. If we don't examine everything critically, we are in fact just the duped disciples of religion. Now, why do I believe the Bible? Well, I kind of hate using that term, Bible. I believe the scriptures, the, the obery portions of the scriptures, I certainly do believe that at least, now I'm not making a definite statement here, I'm saying I do believe that at least one of the Gospels is very uh, true to form, very close to original. No, I don't believe any of them were written in Greek. I do believe that Revelation was inspired and that it is a sort of cipher to the books of the prophets and even some of the books of the law. It is a sort of cipher. It is, um, in a sense, a sister book or a, a daughter book to uh, the law and prophets. Were the, the letters with certain disciples' names put on them, written by those, and I should say apostles, because they were bona fide apostles, right? Picked by you, show himself. I don't know. I, I don't know. If you want me to say, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm sorry. Because I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Because, <clears throat> I've seen enough to cause me to question everything. And we should question everything, examine everything. Now, I've spent enough time studying the uh, what's called the Old Testament to tell you that I believe that almost all of those books that are in our canon have a validity to them. That there is very, very little variation from one account to the other, that they all weave together very, very well. 
in a tapestry-like way. Now, I know about this idea of like the um, the J manuscripts um, and the E manuscripts, this idea that they can tell the difference because in some manuscripts it's Elohim and they use the anglicized transliterations of Masoretic Hebrew, not Obery, and then the other one's Jehovah manuscripts. Those ideas. I get that. I don't have a problem with it other than the fact that I think it's a, another control of the narrative. Sure, various people could have written those books specifically like the books of Moses. I don't have the first problem with that. I don't think Moses had to have written any of those books. Moses wrote a book of the law that he put in the Arun, A-R-U-N, or Ark. That's what he wrote. That's what I know he wrote from the record. But I believe those books because of how consistent the voice is throughout those books. I believe that at least one of the Gospels is true, accurate, and correct, and that Yusho is who he claimed to be, that he was conceived by Yahweh, by the spirit of in his mother. Um, probably her name was likely Marim, M-R-Y-M. I do believe that Revelation is a book meant to be a, a type of daughter book that ciphers the Law and the Prophets from what we call the Old Testament. I haven't had the time to closely examine the other books written by, claimed to be written by apostles, books like James, 1, 2, 3, John, 1, 2, Peter, Jude. I have taken a look at Paul. I've taken enough of a look at Paul and considered the opposition of a lot of his message to the message that I have understood from the rest of Scripture, an opposition to his message that I've understood in in Yusho's words, who he, in at least one gospel, absolutely upholds everything about the Law and Prophets. And it's, it's important we, for us to, to always do this. If we're not willing to do this, then we just love what we have decided to believe. We're in love with that. We'll be fooled by anyone. Because we're all about religion. That's what we want. We don't want the truth. We want religion. So what I've begun doing is anytime I read through anything, let's say, that I'm not entirely familiar with, I take notes. Um, I'm starting to do the same thing, actually, with movies, too, because one thing I can't stop is being a bit of a cinemaphile. Now, most, a lot of the movies I used to like, I don't really like anymore. That's kind of what happens when your worldview changes very dramatically and you start finding out that the people who've been making the movies and the TV shows and all that um, are our good friends. And they have nothing but, but malintent in mind and that they're using all of those just to program us. I can tell you this, I haven't honestly watched a space movie I've enjoyed for years now. Um, and, and that translates to a lot of other movies. Of course, I can't watch Schindler's List. <laughs> um, but, you know, if I watch a movie, if I try watching something new, because I still like to try to watch, you know, new things, I'm going to take notes on how they're programming, because they do that. They do that with such subtlety that most of the people out there watching, they, it, they're being programmed unawares. So this is what I did when I, the last time I went through Luke. I decided I'm going to take some notes on Luke. And I'm going to share those with you. And it's just going to be from start to finish. Now, this is not necessarily me making judgments. I don't know how many 
you know, actual judgments and conclusions I make in here more than just taking notes of some things. Now, here's one of the big things. I've read books, and I, I have books here, by guys who criticize the Bible. They, there are books and lectures and, and whatnot about contradictions in the Bible. Now, I take those seriously. I have uh, I have Charlie Giuliani's book here that I'm trying to to get through, and um, in that one I'm I'm actually taking notes directly in the book with pencil, which sometimes is a lot easier. Um, but he points out a lot of things in the Old Testament. Now that that's the stuff I really enjoy because I can go in there and I can look and I can see is he basing this on absolute undisputed objective fact or you know is there a problem in his logic and reasoning what i've found is most criticisms and attacks on the old testament that's just the case there is a problem either with their logic and reasoning or assumptions they're making or sometimes there can be problems based on the manuscripts used by the people who compiled them and translated them. And oftentimes, I can't believe it, but oftentimes they don't. They don't consider that, which is really not saying much for their the, the level of their intellect or character. I'm not saying that specifically about Charlie because I'm not that far into his book yet. I'm just saying that in general concerning a number of the books that have been produced or, or, or videos or audios. Now, one thing I found is that the contradictions that are pointed out in the Old Testament, they're, they're really not that bad. Now, if you're somebody who is a King James onlyist, and you have to believe that every word is perfect, and every word they did in that translation is perfect, then you have got problems, my friend. You've got problems. And somebody who's sharp is going to come along, and they're going to tear you limb from limb. They're going to tear you up. I could tear you up. It's a bad idea. However, as I said, I don't I have never found contradictions in what's called the Old Testament that I think they're just they're glaring. Like, oh man, that how do you even overcome that? Not as though I would want to overcome it in any dishonest way, but how do you cope with it, you know? However, when I get to the New Testament, and specifically I get to the Gospels, we've got four Gospels, right? That's what's in our accepted canon. And I know there's other Gospels floating around out there too. They call them Gnostic Gospels. I'm not going to call them that. I, I don't know enough about them. Thomas, and I think there's a few others. Um... But we've got four that are in the accepted canon. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everybody knows that, right? Now, if you've ever asked, why is there four Gospels, for one, you might get the answer that goes something like this. Well, it's a sacred number. It's a sacred number in God's uh, cosmology. And, uh, you know, uh, it's... It's like when the Israelites were camped out in the wilderness. You had uh, one, uh, three tribes on the east, and three tribes on the west, and three tribes on the north, and three tribes on the south. And, and you had Levi in the middle with the tabernacle, and the tabernacle, of course, was Jesus. And so that's why you've got four Gospels. And if that's not good enough for you, uh, well, you had 12 tribes, and 12 is evenly divisible by three four times, so there's that, and... Well, there's also, uh, well, there's those creatures in uh, Ezekiel's vision, the living creatures, and uh, each one of them had four faces, and one was like a man, and another like a lion, and another like a bull, and another like an eagle, and that's what those Gospels are like, because one shows him as a servant, and one shows him as a king, so I guess that would be the man, the servant would be the uh, uh, the bull. And one shows him as God, and that's like, uh, that's the eagle. And, uh, 
One shows him as uh, uh, something having to do with a lion. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of what you get, you know, when you try to ask, well, why is there four? But uh, an astute fellow who, who is studying these will look and see that there's probably more contradictions in the four Gospels, pound for pound, than you can find, find in the entirety of the 39 accepted books of the Old Testament. Now, I don't accept all 39 books in the Old Testament. In fact, I very much reject Esther. And there's a, a whole laundry list of reasons why I am not a, not, not a fan of Esther. It's just I don't believe that that was inspired scripture. Okay? And uh, some people out there have made very excellent presentations, both written uh, and audio. Some guys that I don't agree with. I, I disagree with a lot of their uh, rationality and their teachings have still made some very good points concerning Esther. I had my issues with Esther before I ever even heard any of this. I had my issues with Paul before I had ever heard some of the counter-Paul arguments. And I remember the first time I heard some people talking about Paul, their problem with Paul. I had such a terrible reaction to it because I had come to a, you know, a place where I was so thoroughly indoctrinated with Paulianity that my reaction was extremely negative. That's part of the reason why I haven't just outright said, well, I don't think Paul was this or I think he was that, because I'm just reserving until I have time to very thoroughly, very thoroughly, investigate the things that he said. I mean, I have enough I have enough material on Paul right now to tell you that things don't look good. There are many things he teaches that are contradictory to what I see you show teaching. However, we have a bit of a problem because the people out there who will argue for Paul will say things like, well, if you're not for Paul, you've got to throw away most of the New Testament. Okay. What's, what's the downside? Wait, so hold on, hold on, hold on. If Paul was not a genuine, bona fide apostle, why would we want all of his letters? If he's not a genuine, bona fide apostle, and what he said is not true and cannot be backed up, and the things that he teaches are actually contradictory to Scripture, why would we want all of the letters of Paul? Get it? And they'll say, well, then you've got to throw away Acts and Luke. Okay, again, if Acts and Luke are not true, I don't care. If 27 of the 29 books in the New Testament were not accurate, true, were not written by who they said, went against the rest of Scripture, the whole bulk, the major portion of Scripture, which is called the Old Testament, that is by far the major portion of Scripture. If, if those books go against it, I don't care who gets pitched, because they are going to be judged against the light of Scripture, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And if they don't measure up, well, then the fact is they don't measure up, so who'd want to keep them? So let's just be good students, and let's consider Luke. Because, for one thing, yeah, um, Luke is intrinsically connected to Paul. Some who were critically looking at the book of Acts might even call Acts a um, bait-and-switch operation. I mean, did you show or did he not handpick 12 apostles, gave them authority? So when he was gone, they had the authority to choose the replacement of Judah, who they translate as Judas. It was his name. It was Judah. You can check. Judas. 
and we don't have any other witnesses than um, these accounts written by this persona called Luke concerning Paul. Now, Luke is then also supposed to be a non-Israelite, which that's a little odd. I'm not going to say that's like a make or break, necessarily. However, every other book that we're aware of was written by an Israelite because they were a people that was chosen by Yahweh through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to keep his covenants to have a, a very personal and very special and unique relationship with, which has meant a great deal of blessings in the sense of knowing him and being a very special people, and it's also carried with it a great amount of cursings. We, Jacob Israel, as a people, have been through horrors that other people have not for a very long time. So, Yahweh has his reasons for doing everything that he does. Um, for any of you that, have, that, for instance, listened to part seven of the Obrey Hours, understand my view on this whole idea of salvation. And that I think we've got a lot of things maybe wrong to one degree or another. Okay? But let's start with Luke. We're talking about the Gospel of Luke. Okay? His account of the life, the death, the resurrection of the anglicized Jesus Christ, the Christ. Now, the, the first thing that's interesting is the etymology of the name Luke. Now, could Luke be Greek? That's actually a good question. Could Luke be Greek? Well, because they tell us, okay, here, let's do this. I knew I shouldn't have closed out that page. I had it all ready to go. Sorry, I had a page ready to go here that was just kind of like an introductory page to the Gospel of Luke, all right? Here it is. It's by BibleScripture.net. And one thing you'll find uh, on a lot of these documents, which again, this is why I started out this whole thing the way I did, is they all keep going back to the same very, very limited sources of men that we don't know much about at all. Okay. So anyways, this, this is going to be similar to what you might find if you went to uh, and got an introduction to it from, from a lot of commentaries, so on and so forth. Some may be far more extensive, some may be far simpler, okay? This is just one. The Gospel according to Luke, or in the Greek, L-O-U-K-A-N, Lukan, is one of four Gospels in the New Testament of the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? We knew that. And, by the way, that Lucan could actually just be a Hellenized form of a, a name in another language. Now, St. Luke, so this sounds a little Catholic to me. St. Luke, what makes him a saint? Because, you know, I know what saints are. Saints are those who have specifically been set apart for a certain reason, the work of Yahweh. That's who he calls Israel in the Old Testament. So I don't know why they're calling him a saint. When you see the saints in the New Testament, that is Yahweh's people that he made his covenant with, Israel. Okay, St. Luke was a Syrian born in Antioch and one of the earliest converts to Christianity. So now we've got a problem. We've got converts. He was a convert. No one could really convert to be in Israel. Now, you could actually decide in some cases to go and be among, live among Israel as an Israelite, okay, but conversion, yeah, I'm not sure how that works. Even if you weren't an Israelite, there were certain rules and laws concerning if someone bred with somebody else who was a non-Israelite, and I don't mean a different race. I mean of the same race, but not an Israelite, not coming genetically from the children of Jacob. There were certain rules and conditions to breeding somebody back in from something like that. Anyways, 
yeah, we see the idea of converts being expressed in uh, Ezra, where the Samaritans, uh, so-called, tried to come and build the temple and the wall that they were rebuilding with them. And they said, well, you can't do that. You're not, an, you're not Israelites. Don't you understand? This is a covenant made with a genetic people. Anyways, it says Luke, well-educated in classical Greek and noted for his literary talent. Let me stop. I'm sorry. I, I am. I, I just want to put a cap on what I just said. I want to cap it off, finish it off, okay? And tell you where I'm coming from, okay? And we're a lot of people who are Israelites that don't know and don't believe that they're Israelites, who maybe believe the Jews are, or maybe the Hebrews. I don't know. Here's my, my mentality about this, okay? If I wasn't aware of the overwhelming amount of evidence that many of the common Western European peoples, Germanics, Gauls, uh, Anglos, so on and so forth, were the descendants of the tribes of Israel, if I were unaware of that, and I had come to this point anyways, in understanding a lot of things, well, let's just say I found out that most of the information, most of the clues, the signs, the fruits, and everything else pointed to somebody else, a people who were not genetically related to me. Like they were clearly another people. I don't mean another race. I mean another people from another seed line. Because in Europe, just because they're white, that does not mean they're the same people from the same seed line. Ne Noah had three sons. Their descendants had a number of nations who went far away. This is where Israel finally ended up being over a long course of time, and this was the land of their captivity. We call it Europe. And many of those nations from Japheth, from Ham, maybe some of them from Shem. Shem had a number of sons, besides the son that eventually Abraham came through, and thus Isaac and Jacob. So, anyways, if I found out, say, I was just descended from one of the other sons of Shem, from Ham, from Japheth, who knows, man, if I, if I saw the evidence that told me that our good friends who are posing as Israel, or even the Hebrews, were actually Israel, I can tell you what I'd want to do. I would want to do everything that I could in my power to... For, to help them to understand who they were, that they had a special charge and mission, they had a special work to do, and a special place in Yahweh's cosmology in his overall plan. I would probably want to stay quite near to them, to be a help to them, um, but also preserve myself, my family, my seed line, and my race. Not over and above them, but yes, they would have a very special place with me, because they would have all the signs of being the Israel of Yahweh. I just happen to know that I'm part of that Israel of Yahweh. So if other people come and they, they are not of the same uh, seed line as me and, and the kinfolk that I have, that would be my suggestion. Because that's exactly what I would do. That's exactly what I did and how I lived my life before I found out who the actual Israelites are by overwhelming abundance of evidence. But the thing is, the way it tends to turn out most of the time, people want the religion. They very much want certain universalist ideas that they've been taught because they don't want to admit how special and unique Israel is and that they hold a special and unique place with Yahweh. That doesn't mean that's the only people. It doesn't mean that every individual in Israel is super special and, and unique other than the fact that they are the sons of Jacob. But there are many Israelites that he wholesale slaughtered over the years for their disobedience. Let's be very clear. And he is faster to do that 
with the people he's in covenant with. Because he's in covenant with them. So it carries a very heavy burden. It doesn't mean that he does not care about anyone else. We see him having relationships with various individuals long before a nation called Israel was ever established. And even after the nation is established, we see him sending Jonah the prophet to Nineveh, Nineveh the capital or great city of Ashur, Assyria, because he was going to destroy them and he wanted them to repent and be saved. They were not Israelites. Even after Israel was a nation, he was still working with a prophet named um, Balaam, as the anglicized transliteration, Balaam. There's no evidence that he was an Israelite. He was, um, uh, all the evidence points to him uh, being uh, uh, an Amory, which is where Jacob or Abraham's family had settled, was in the area of the tribe of, of Amor. Um, not Amor, I'm sorry, Aram. An Arami. Aram. Aram, Amor, one letter difference, sorry. Um, and, and then, of course, the, uh, the prophet uh, Nahum wrote a book of prophecy to. Ninua, Ashur, also, that whole book is dedicated to them. And all throughout the major prophets, uh, Yahweh is giving messages to all of the surrounding nations who were not Israelites, oftentimes to encourage them to repent because there was judgment coming upon them too. So there are, there are a lot of distorted viewpoints. We, we need to make some of those, I think, a little clearer if we can. So the guy goes on to say, Luke is, a, is unique in that he was the only Gentile, I hate that term, let's say non-Israelite, to compose a New Testament book. Luke was a physician, uh, according to Colossians 4, 10 through 14, likely accompanied Paul on three of, of four missionary journeys, as described in Acts, the book that this persona called Luke was alleged to have written. The we passages from Acts 16.1 to Acts 28.16 um, are apparently supposed to be referring to Luke. Uh, it's possible that the date of the composition of Luke's gospel was before 70 AD, according to the introduction of Acts, which I don't know how that works. I've read, was he talking about like somebody like a commentary introduction to Acts? The gospel of Luke was written first, according to that. Now, I don't believe that. I don't think there's any evidence of that. It is noted that the X, well, one of the reasons you'll see is because Luke has all of the earmarks of being a cut and paste job from other Gospels, specifically Matthew, and I'll show you. It is noted that the Acts of the Apostles ends abruptly with St. Paul under house arrest around 62 AD. I know, it ends really weird. And it's really strange that it starts out with the actual Apostles that you show actually picked and actually commissioned to go to the actual people that he came to save, actually. But after chapter 10 or 11, completely abandons these actual men he picked, who according to Revelation would be setting to judge the, the 12 tribes of Israel, but they're not that important, I guess, once we hit Acts chapter 11, then it's nothing but Paul, 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 Paul. With no mention of his trial or his subsequent activities, he does not mention the Roman persecution of Christians in the mid-60s, nor the martyrdom of Peter and Paul, the leading figures in Acts, and there's no mention of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Well, all of that, again, is speculation. Yes, even the, um, the martyrdom of Peter and Paul they're speculation. They come from documents that are speculation. Their traditional promise of a Savior for all humanity is fulfilled. Okay, and he goes in. All right. I can give you a little bit of a mindset on what most of churchianity perceives Luke as. And this has been a big thing that... The fact that they're like, well, look there. 
as a Gentile, and he wrote one of the Gospels. It was a really good Gospel and Acts. Universalism, hey! We like, uh, we like our mystical salvation and universalism. What's wrong with that, huh? It feels good. We like to feel good. You know, you like to feel good? This, it's not about how you feel. It's not about if it makes you feel good. It's what the facts say. It's what Scripture says. It's what we can accurately and responsibly, to the best of our abilities, understand about them. So, let's see. Is Luke a bona fide a Greek in name? Maybe. Do a, a an exact an exact study. Let's see, Luke. Oh, it's contracted, like I hate to say it, like a virus. It's contracted. Sorry, from the Latin Lucanus. Well, I hate to tell you, but that Latin Lucanus sounds like it was transliterated from something else. Just its suffixes makes it sound like. It might have been transliterated from something else. Now, let's just say maybe it was transliterated from Obery. Then what did it actually mean, starting with the L? It could come from one of a couple of entries we can find in Strong's. The first one being H, 1980. And I am sorry if the fan... I don't know how, how strongly the fan is coming through. It is uh, It is kind of a balmy mid-Michigan day. So I apologize for that. And I don't know if there's any way that I can run a filter on that in um, Screencast-O-Matic or not. We'll see. Strong's H1980. E-L-K. Elk. Elk. Just like the animal elk. Elek. Or elek. Or Strong's H3212. Luck. So that's your base root there. Luck. And it's used very consistently many hundreds of times as go, went, walk, wander, traveler, wander, traveler, to luck, la luck. Um, the static form of that would be something like Luke, maybe a traveler, to travel. Traveling's his business. Wandering's his business. Whose business was wandering that I know of in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah. Cain. Now, contrast that to Matthew. Most likely from H4294, Matteo. A staff or a rod. And in, in some places you'll see that this word, or a very similar word, is translated as inscribe or even stylus. Now, I am going to warn you, I do most of my comparisons in this Luke. Most of them are not to the other three Gospels. Most of them are simply to the Gospel of Matthew. First off, if I compared it to all the other three Gospels, it would be an extraordinarily long document, for one. Secondly, I use Matthew as my control because Matthew is the closest gospel to all of the the very true to form concepts with with the so-called old testament of all the gospels matthew is the most right on the money staying true to everything we see conceptually from the so-called old testament that's why matthew is my control in this okay um, plus, Matthew is, and Luke are very similar in form. Like I said, I, Luke was almost, it, it almost strikes me as, as somebody taking a lot of concepts and the form of Matthew and really just rearranging them. Really bad, too. And you'll see that. Really bad in some cases. You're like, oh my gosh. Because they are very, Sharp, sharp <laughs> differences. Um, so his gospel. Let's start with this. Luke was not an eyewitness. 
whatever else Luke may or may, may not have been, if, if, if an individual named Luke wrote that. And we even have to question that. Yes, we do. Okay? If an individual named Luke wrote that, he was not an eyewitness to the life and the actions of Yusho and the death and the resurrection of Yusho. He was not an eyewitness to that. Matthew was. Matthew, as recorded in his account, was indeed a chosen apostle and was witness to all these events. Okay? All right, so Luke addresses his account to, uh, to a person or personages named Theophilus. Now, the Theo is uh, it's the word forming element meaning God, gods, or capital G-O-D, from the Greek Theos, God. And then you got Philo. Uh, it's a word forming element meaning loving, fond of, tending to. Uh, the Greek Philos, adjective, dear, loved, beloved, as a noun, friend, from Philen, to love, regard, with affection. Um, not necessarily a proper name, okay? Make that clear. Um, but it very much could be to address it to the God lover or even the religious. Okay, so let's start with point number one. The account of John the Baptist's parents, the things that allegedly transpired with them before the birth of John, the guy called John the Baptist, are only to be found in Luke. No other gospel, nowhere else are those events to be found, and those are in Luke 1, 5 through 1, 80. So just to take a look, and this is probably going to be in multiple parts, you know, as I have little time here and there in the afternoon or whatever, because I'm trying to put out more material as much as I possibly can. I have a tendency where I will stick my nose in the Bible, my books, my tables, and my studies, and I don't even care if I make videos, I really. And so I'm really trying to fight that, and I'm trying to be as helpful as possible, not because I believe everything I say or think is right, but because I have an opinion and perspective, and I have certain facts that others don't. And I'm trying to get as many of them out as I can, whenever I can. This will have to be in multiple parts because the document I put together of notes, it's like a nine-page document. And we have to read through these portions in the text. I can't just go through those nine pages and say, well, this note says this, and this note says it's that. Okay? So, in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 5, this is the account of John the Baptist's parents. It is only to be found in the account of Luke. It says in the King James, and everybody knows why I use the King James, it's not because I love it or it's my favorite or I even think it's really good. It's because it's coded to Strong's and it makes it very easy to navigate in. Luke 1.5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. Now, in the book of Chronicles, it describes the courses of the Levites and the priests, the Ken, K-E-N, Ken, not Kohen, not Kohen, the Ken, or the Kenim. Uh, the Kenim were, they were also Levites, they were from the tribe of Levite, but they were uh, descendants of Aaron through specific sons, two sons, um, uh, let's see, the Anglicized Koath and... Um, Oh, I think Gershon. Anyways, or maybe that's one of, I'm sorry, one of Moses' sons. However, you will find it in the book of Chronicles. Luke, one thing you can say about Luke. Luke does bring up a lot of very interesting points about the Law and the Prophets and relates certain things to the Law and the Prophets. Like, this is a guy who really knows what he's talking about. It's funny. I mean, if, if he was a Gentile and he was sort of a universalist Gentile and he wasn't a convert, which this whole idea of being a convert was just, it's 
it's something you don't you don't find it in the Old Testament. You don't find this idea of being a convert. You don't find this idea of going out and trying to convince people to be Israelites. It's, you don't find it. So that's one weird thing about this whole universalist, inclusionistic idea that we have surrounding our religion, that most of us have been practicing a religion based mostly on the New Testament and based predominantly on the writings of Paul. However, yeah, Luke does does include a lot of this uh, this technical talk, which is interesting if he's supposed to be a Gentile and all that. So, I guess he would have been very, very knowledgeable on those things. If so, okay. So, anyways, he was supposed to be in the course of Abia. They're named, and uh, you'll find them in Chronicles. The course of Abia. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, so they they would both have to be Levites. And if he was a priest and not simply a Levite, because Levites had different jobs than priests, only the, those of the house of Aaron could do certain things. Could in the uh, the Beit Yahweh, which they oftentimes translate as temple, it was the house. It was a it was Beit Yahweh. It was a house of Yahweh. Anyways, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances. Uh, of the Lord blameless. That's good. We see that with people, by the way. You know, when people say such and such wasn't perfect, well, the Bible describes a lot of people as being righteous and upright in the Old Testament before Jesus. It certainly does. That alone should challenge our preconceived notions about salvation and our religion. And they had no child. Because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. It's interesting that it's translated as well stricken in years because that sounds very much like a phrase that would have been used in the Obery Old Testament. Um, it oftentimes would have been days, but it's interesting because it, it's just similar. It came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. So anytime we see God, if this was written in Obri, it ought to be Aliyim. And if it was, if it was written in Obri, every time we, we'd see Lord, that's when uh, the Koine would have put in um, Curios. And that should be Yahweh, because when we look at the Septuagint, every time Yahweh is used in uh, Obri, you'll see Kyrios in uh, the Koine. Anyways, uh, so according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of Yahweh or the Lord. Uh, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of Yahweh standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Maybe I should just read it as he, re you know, the Lord. Because I don't know if Luke was, was originally written in Obri or not. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. In Obri, that would be Iun. Y-U-N, Iun. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and may shall rejoice. many shall rejoice at his birth. Um, the only other variation of that would be Yohanan, uh, which is where like the German Johann comes from, Johann, uh, which you would have to have an H in there. It is a variation. Um, if they're just calling him John, I'm going to have to assume we're talking about Iun. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Now, th this Holy Ghost is something that you see way, 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 way more in the New Testament than you see in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, I went and took my e-sword and I entered 
both ruh, which is wind, spirit, breath, and kodesh, um, meaning kind of like sanctified, set apart, kodesh. And you don't find it that often. Now, you'll find uh, those two words in verses together, but not necessarily relating to one another. You only find it in Psalm 51.13, Isaiah 63.10, Isaiah 63.11, and that's it. But you see it all the time in the New Testament. And it's not, uh, you, you'll hear the, the way our friends have changed it to sound, which is Ruach Echakodesh. It, it would be more um, Ruch Kodesh. The Ruch Kodesh. Anyways, moving forward. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, or Elisha, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now this whole turning of the hearts, that's something that he's, he's taking from Malachi. There is the prophecy of Malachi, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Now here it says before him the spirit of Elisha to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So he doesn't actually quote that whole part of Malachi. He quotes this little. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man. My wife is well stricken in years. Boy, that, does that not just sound a lot like Abraham and Sarah? Now the angel answering unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. So Gabriel gets around a lot, because Gabriel was also the angel who was supposed to have appeared to, to Joseph and Mary, right? He was the, uh, was the messenger, the Malach, that appeared to Daniel. Okay? Um, his name actually should come from Geber Al, the, uh, the strong man of Al, Geber Al. That's exactly how it, it, it appears in Obri, Geber Al. Now, he says, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Behold, you shall be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because you believed not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, so that would be his priestly course that he would have to perform, he departed to his own house. And every one of them would do... See, there were, I want to say there were 12 courses, they were two weeks at a time, and so they would have to be performed, I believe, two times per year. It's how they would do their, their course rotation. They would do a couple of weeks at a time. Uh, anyway, so, and the people waited for Zacharias, they marveled, oh, I did all that, sorry. Um, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Because, yeah, it's a reproach when a woman doesn't have a child, especially a man-child, but any children. You see, a, a, a man wants his wife to have a man-child because that carries on his family's name. It was very important. And today women think... It's just so darn important for them to have a career. That's just so important. It's so important for them to, to express themselves, to be heard. But if they spent enough time in the Bible, they would see that it was very important for them to bear children to their husband. She had reproach upon her. Why? 
She hadn't done anything wrong. It even said that she was righteous according to the law, and that is righteous. But she had reproach among women, among everybody, because she hadn't borne any children. Um, let's see. So, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, to the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in unto her, and he said, Hail, thou, uh, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, you shall call his name Jesus. So this we also see in other Gospels. In fact, we can see that um, he appears to Joseph in Matthew one twenty three. Here he's appearing, appearing to Mary. Now the birth of Jesus in Matthew. It says. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise, when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name. And I went over this in, uh, I think, episode 7. Yusho. Even in the Greek. Yisu. Because he will what? Sozo. Sho. Provide deliverance. Save his people from their sins. What are their sins? The breaking of the law. Who are his people? Israel who were currently in punishment and banishment from the land because of their breaking of the law, their much breaking of the law. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Om Oman Ual. Um, God is for us, he's with us. Um, th that's, and you'll find that in Isaiah seven or eight now here he is he's we've got this angel who didn't even name himself but he appears to joseph this is in matthew doesn't appear to mary in luke he appears to mary now some would say now that's a big contradiction that's a huge difference uh the guys who want to defend the four gospel model would say well he could have appeared to joseph and mary Okay, it's just in this gospel, he appeared to Joseph, and that's what was recorded. And the other, he appeared to Mary, and that's what was recorded. Well, they could say that. It still appears a little contradictory. He appeared to Mary in there. And there's this story about John the Baptist that we can't confirm from another source. We only have this one source. This is the great thing about the Old Testament, is you have so many overlapping, interweaving sources that are either confirming each other by their overlapping of multiple writers writing about the same things that happen, and so on and so forth, or like in the case of the prophets, you have so many prophets that are speaking the same overlapping ideas that simply weave into each other. And here you have... This account of, of John the Baptist and his parents, which just quite simply is not confirmed anywhere else. And you have this Gabriel appearing to Mary in the book of Luke, when in fact the angel of the Lord, which doesn't identify himself as Gabriel, just the angel of the Lord, appears to Joseph. Now we can go back to Luke, because here's the thing. As I developed these notes, I was going through, it was a development of notes. Um, the, the earlier ones are, um, the earlier the notes, they're far more simplistic. 
so I might have left some things out. And I'm going to have to look through this as I go. And um, let's just, for one thing, I find it, it's interesting that um, we have, let me go back when the angel appears to, uh, to Zacharias. Um, oh my gosh, I thought this would be a lot easier. I just want to find the word Gabriel for crying out loud. If I don't find it here pretty quick, I'm going to have to pause, find it, and restart. Oh, my goodness. Wow, so I finally found it. I can't believe it took that long. Gabriel only appears in the New Testament twice, both in this first chapter of Luke. The only place where you'll, you'll find the name Gabriel, as in an angel being named, is in Daniel. And only during Daniel 8.16 and Daniel 9.21 you'll find this Gabriel name, but all of a sudden he pops his head back up in Luke. Well, I mean, if, if angels, if Malak are, I don't know if I can use the word eternal, but, you know, if they don't die, there you go, you got this angel named... Uh, named Gabriel, right? In Daniel, you, you'll find that Daniel's just about the only book that, that tends to name, you know, any of these Malak. You have Gabriel named uh, it's two times there that I showed you in Daniel, and then you've, you've got this Michael, Michal, named in uh, Daniel 12, and I still haven't gotten to some of my uh, my thoughts on Daniel uh, 11 and 12, which I, I should do that as another video. Let's consider Daniel. And now, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not gonna I'm not not trying to pick apart Daniel as you know as inorganic or not not inspired. It's different. We'll have to get to that at some point because I have a lot of notes. I take a lot of notes on a lot of things. But anyways, there you have. Gabriel. He only shows up in Luke. He's named Gabriel. And the accounts of who this uh, angel of the Lord, named as Gabriel only in Luke, appears to Mary and Luke and to Joseph and Matthew, which might be a contradiction. It might not. And this story about the inception of John the Baptist, even though it seems to kind of echo Abraham and Sarah's situation with Isaac, if not paralleling, sort of mimicking, it can't be confirmed anywhere else, and it's not confirmed anywhere else. It's only in Luke. Okay, so move forward a little bit. Now, the shepherd account. Everything that we kind of have come to be used to with this whole, whole idea of the Christmas story and away in a manger and the shepherds out and, you know, the angels singing to the shepherds and all. This all pretty much comes from Luke. Just about all of it comes from Luke. Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion, he said he based it on the Gospel of John, but he got a lot of his information out of Luke. Not a lot of people concentrate on Matthew. And did you know Matthew is the only gospel that we actually have a Hebrew version of floating around? And there's an interesting story behind that Hebrew version, which I don't have time to go into right now. But it is. There is a Hebrew version floating around. It was actually penned, or the version that we have, is penned in the Assyrian block script. But nonetheless, it is a Hebrew version, and it's quite interesting, the wording that's used in that, um, in contradistinction to some of the wording and terminology that you'll find in the Greek version of Matthew. Uh, anyhow, so the shepherd account only in Luke 2, 8 through 2, 21. Not nearly as long as a, a passage as that other one was. I got like part of the way through that passage and I'm like, Jesus, this is, this is really, really, really long. I'll truncate it. So then in Luke 2, 8, we start out with that whole account of Luke's own, Luke's alone of the inception of John the Baptist and all that. 
Now then we come to Luke 2. This is the, the birth of Jesus Christ as he's known of today. Now Luke 2, 1 through 7 is basically similar to what we'll see in Matthew about why they were actually in Bethlehem and all that. Okay, So then Luke 2, 8, again, this is a witness that, that we don't have anywhere else. We don't have another gospel that's telling us about these shepherds. Um, so it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. All people. Not to Israel, but to all people. Well, that's okay, because we'll just say all by proxy, right? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So what we're typically led to believe is that when we see Christos, it is the equivalent of Mashiach. Um, she, uh, meaning to anoint or to cover. Mashi. Um, and I can see that because Christos is supposed to be the same thing. Okay, Christ the Lord. Now this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Probably something like that. Maybe they were a little more in tune. Now it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. They came with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, I'm just, all the Christmas songs are just flowing through my head right now. When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Because Mary's very wise in Luke. And the shepherds returned. Remember, she's the one that Gabriel the angel came to, not her husband. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all these things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yushal, Isus. Let me just see actually the form that Luke chooses here in 221 just for kicks. Okay. Uh, go to the Greek New Testament. And he just uses the form. Ah. He uses the Iesus form. Where in Matthew we see it oftentimes as simply Iesu or sometimes Iesun. But we might see it in all those different forms in Luke as we go. We'll have to see, because the name Yesu in its different forms is, uh, and, and I, you know, of course, I'm using the Greek there, probably shows up quite a few times in Luke. So anyways, there you have it. Only found in Luke, that account, why the shepherds were told and told to go see him, I don't know. I don't know. You you know you can come up with a reason. You can say, well, they were they're going to go out and witness about him all over the countryside and all that. And yeah, this all strikes me as rather strange. Now we clearly see. Let's just take from the Gospel of Matthew. What we see is we see uh, we see you show when he's an adult. We see him going to uh, to be baptized by John. And we see the spirit of Yahweh ascending on him at that baptism, which it, it would appear that John witnessed. Uh, maybe just John. Okay? Because, here's the funny thing. We see him over and over and over. Over and over and over. Telling people, don't tell people who I am. Do you notice that? 
He tells people over and over again, don't go spreading this around. Don't go telling everybody that I'm this or whatever. All right? Just keep it quiet. But then in Luke's account, we see these angels announcing his birth to all these shepherds. Come see him and go tell all your friends. Go tell all your friends and while you're at it, why don't you mention it to Herod? Who's going to try to kill him? Did you notice in the account of Herod, these men, they come from, um, well, in, in, in Matthew it says they come from the east. Actually, it says they, they said, we saw a star in the east, and it's really strange. When they say that, you, you have a real hard time even in the language making out what they're saying. Are they saying that we saw his star eastward, or we were in the east and saw his star? It's weird. Anyways, these guys, they're called, they, they sometimes transliterate them as magi, but it's really the, the word that they're using there is just magoi, um, basically meaning nationals. Could be like somebody nationalized. The, the term goi is used all the time. G-U-Y in, in the, uh, the so-called Old Testament. It's virtually the same word as is used for the body, like literally the physical body. Okay? But that's who comes to see him. These guys are magoi, magi. And what do they do? Well, they're looking for him, and, and they, they go to Herod. And they're, they're unaware of, of Herod's intentions at that point. They realize that Herod has got a bloodlust to, to kill this child who is in the line of King David. He's in the line of King David. So he is to be the king of Judah. And if he's in the line of King David, he's meant to be the king of all Israel. Okay? So Herod, you know, tries to kill him. He, kill, he murders all these children. But for some reason, these angels in Luke... They're like, yeah, hey, you know, it's, screw Herod. We got this under control. We're going to tell all these shepherds. I don't know why. God knows. I, that seems a little un, not so consistent to me. Okay, so moving forward, the next point is none of the accounts in Luke 2 are in other Gospels. Not Simeon, not Anna, not the post Passa or Passover disappearance. And how could he slip away and disobey his parents? That's in Luke 2, 41 and 52. Now, real quick, Simeon and Anna, these are, are two people who were supposed to be uh, just righteous people waiting for the appearance of uh, Mashiach. Uh, Messiah. We don't see them in any other account. Okay, so now I say, how could he slip away and disobey his parents? Now that's in Luke 2, 41 through 52. As he was sinless. Right? He, he was sinless. Now, I, I, also, because slipping away and disregarding his parents like that, that's disobedient. You can't, you can't be disobedient according to the law. A disobedient child is very strictly punished, and in some cases, they're actually killed. Yahweh did not mess around with disobedient children. Disobeying your parents was a violation of the law and thus a sin. Now, I also go on to say, how would his parents not understand if he said, quote, I am about my father's business. If they were both told by the angel of his coming and who he was, and if we believe that both Matthew and Luke were both authentic gospels, then both of his parents were told by an angel before his coming. But if we want to just go with Luke, at least Mary was. At least. How would they not understand what he's talking about? 
Luke 2, 41 through 53. Okay. Now he says, And he said unto them, See, when they came to him, when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have thou dealt with us like this? Behold, your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. We were so distraught. You're gone. You're missing. How could you do this to us? We're freaking out. We're freaking out. You're 12. You're 12 years old. And then it says, And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Really? Really? And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. So he was disobeying them, right? And now he's going to obey them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Again, just like before. And he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So anyways, that's that. How would they not understand? Did they forget they had like short-term memories? Yeah, I know. I know the angel appeared to me before he was born. I know. I know Herod murdered all these babies looking for him and we had to run off to Mitzram. In the New Testament, they do call it Ageptus. They do that in the Greek Septuagint too. Yeah, we had to run off there and I mean to hide him from Herod, the angel, Herod, and and if Luke's account was correct, we had the shepherds come. They said the angels appeared to them and were singing choruses of Christmas carols. And it was amazing. But we have no idea what he's talking about 12 years later when he says, be about my father's work. What are you talking about? Be about your father's work. Joseph's right here. He's a carpenter. I don't see you building anything. You're talking about being about your father's work. I don't get it. Hey, Joe, do you get it? No, I don't get it. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't, I, eh, that just doesn't really make sense to me. The next one, and this is actually, um, this will be the last point I'll cover in this one because I don't, I don't want to put these videos like really past an hour and a half, okay? This one is huge. It's huge. And I mean, if you see people trying to deal with it, they hardly even know how to deal with it. Seriously, man. You'll see people say stuff like, well, um, well, you see, uh, in Matthew, the genealogy is of the father. And in Luke, he uh, gives the genealogy of uh, the, the mother. Genealogies of women were never given ever, ever, ever. That doesn't mean women aren't important. Women are important. If you're a woman and you're listening, I'm not saying you're unimportant. The Bible's not saying you're unimportant, okay? What the Bible is saying is that genealogies are traced through the man. That's just that, man. You know, I'm not a big James Brown fan, but he was right. It's a man's world. And not because we're, we're douchey, cisgender whatevers. It's because that's the way it was established. The man is the ultimate authority before Yahweh on earth. That's a fact. So, so when men who are supposed to be occupying their rightful place in Yahweh's government being the head of their home and their family, like powder puffs, just crumple up and use Romans 13 and kowtow to people who are assumed authorities over them. It just makes me physically ill. Now, everybody has a place, but everybody has to stay within law. And the man is the highest authority 
in the family. The only authority higher than him, you could say king, but Israel didn't always have a king. You could say, and of course, but believe me, I'm not discounting you, show, okay? He is literally our living king, and I truly believe that. I truly believe he's alive, and that he literally is, I could use the word reigning. And he's sitting with Yahweh as our king, sovereign, as our king. I'm not going to get into the whole idea of God and Alayim at this point in time, but the man is the highest authority in government. He doesn't have authority per se to do certain things. He doesn't have the same authority that, say, a Levite might have to do a certain thing or given to a prophet or whatever because there are always certain specifics that Yahweh may deem that a certain man has and in some cases a woman has certain authorities to do certain things. I'm not discounting any of that. I'm saying the fact remains that genealogies, the seed line, is coming through the male seed. That's where the seed comes from, is the male. The woman carries the child. Women are very important. Nobody's minimizing women. I certainly am not. I love women. Couldn't live without them. Yeah, maybe, but it, it just it wouldn't be any fun. And I don't mean like fun. You know, men and women need each other. Men and women are both integral components in, in reproduction and carrying on our seed line. In a righteous society, women are prized because they carry our seed. And they're, they're so, they're just physically, if you're a man and you're a real man, you can't help but be attracted to women physically. It's the way we were built. And women are attracted to men in their own set of ways based on the way they were built. So when I talk about women and women's place and men and men's place, that isn't to denigrate any women. That isn't to elevate any men any more than Yahweh has established in his order. And he has established a hierarchy in his order. I'm simply trying to establish and keep and live up to what my place is in that hierarchical order. And to interrelay it to you. Genealogies are recorded through a man. And the genealogy getting to you show from David has to be recorded through the men. And it really doesn't follow for the people who have said, well, the, the genealogy in Matthew is Joseph's genealogy and the genealogy of Luke is Mary's. And you'll see why. First off, you have the, the generations from Abraham to Matthew. Now, in Matthew, it's interesting. Matthew begins at Yusho, and he goes back. Joseph, Jacob, Mathan, Eliezer, Eliud, Akim, Sadak, Azor, Eliakim, Abiud, Zerobabel, and so forth. There is really only one kind of odd omittance I found in the Greek version of Matthew, I haven't checked the, the only Hebrew version I'm aware of. It's called Shem Tov's Hebrew, Matthew. I haven't checked that yet to see if that issue is resolved because it seems like there is one less man in that line. There should be, um, there should be 14, then 14, then 14. It seems that one of them there's not. But besides for that, it's right on the money. All the references you can find in the so-called Old Testament, 
you'll find that it, it follows very well with that seed line genealogy, okay? With the one in Luke, oh man, not so good. Actually, you know what? I misspoke. I apologize. I apologize. Just amazingly apologize. I'm so very sorry. Um, so what you have is in Matthew 1 1, it starts out the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it begins with Abraham and goes all the way forth to Yusho. That's the way genealogies are recorded in the Obery scriptures. I vastly apologize for saying the only reason I was looking at it on my notes and I put them both in the same order. I put Matthews in the same order as Luke's so that I could compare the two. I apologize. Matthews is stated correctly the way that genealogies are stated in the so-called Old Testament. It starts with Abraham and it goes forth to Yusho. Okay? Luke, besides the fact that we don't know whose side this is supposed to be on, Luke goes backwards. That's never done. You start with the oldest descendant that you want to go from. And, and in the case of Matthew, it starts with Abraham because the nation was established in Abraham. All right, And we can see the genealogy of Abraham. We have it in Genesis. We also have it in Chronicles. Luke goes backwards. Now, Matthew has, b b besides that one, which seems like it could just simply be a manuscript error, Matthew has the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, let's see. And then Jehoiakim fathered Saltiel. So that should be 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. So that's three times at 14 a pop. And that makes complete sense. And that gives you the 14 generations from Abraham to David. That gives you 14 generations from David to the carrying away. And that gives you 14 from the carrying away to Yusha. Which also, if you've got that, it really doesn't give you what they say was 400 years or so from the carrying away, which actually have to be 500 or so. That really doesn't add up quite right. And that's, that's an interesting point to take a look at. Some of the things they tell us in the way that they add up, like in the, what seems to be reality or what would work in reality, it's not the same. So we always have to question everything we've been told about these manuscripts, the Bible, and everything else. So in Luke, instead of having 42, how many characters do we have? Well, Luke actually goes all the way back to Adam, but I stopped at Abraham, okay? So Luke has got, let's see, starting at Jesus. Jesus, Joseph, so it's not Mary's line. The people who have said, they're probably Mary, it says Joseph, it says Joseph. Jesus, Joseph, Heli, Matat. Wait a minute, we have almost a match here from uh, Mathan to Mathat, except we have Jacob instead of Heli. Yeah, maybe we're on to something. Mathat, Levi, Melchi, Jana, Joseph, Matthias, Amos, Nahum, Elsie. From here on out, there is nothing similar. Now, I put in black the similar names, and I put in red the ones that do not match up any way, shape, or form. And I'll tell you about that. You can see it on the screen. That's why I do these ones in Screencast-O-Matic. Now, we do have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and we got one missing. All right, we'll just say 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, starting at 0 Babel. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. And that's where it should end, right? No! We've still got more. 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. 
156. So instead of 42, like we have in Matthew, there's 56. Yeah, that's a 14 name. I guess there was one more 14 man generation going on there that, that maybe Matthew forgot. Him. That's 14 guys in the same time period from Abraham. 14. 14 more guys there. So even if it was from Mary, you, you're telling me, okay, so her descendants, they were having their sons at a much younger age, which I don't see how that's possible because you have to understand, during the uh, the line of all these kings, at least up into the time of probably like um, Jerubbabel, which was when they came back from uh, Babylon, these kings were having their sons, their oldest sons, who were their heirs, at really early ages. I'm not kidding. They were fathering them at like 15 or 16. Which when you think about it, when a lot of, you know, a lot of young men out there, if they can and they have a willing partner, they do start having sex at, at an age, like, you know, and even younger than that. Because they are mature enough to do it, their seed is mature enough to do its job and in those mid-teen years a lot of 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 young people boys and girls are mature enough to conceive and have children many of those kings had their heirs when they were just teenagers so we can't just say well maybe if it was mary's line even though it's simply it specifically says from jesus to joseph but let's live in fantasy land and say maybe that would be the case. We still have the fact that out of the 42, which is three blocks of 14, at least one full block of that was guys having children really young. And then if this was Mary's seed line, somehow it diverts from the time we get to David. It goes crazy until we get to Joseph, and then we're back on track again just doesn't follow. Now, out of all those names, I can tell you ones that there's no match to whatsoever. And in some of these cases, I was really liberal, where I was like, all right, well, you know, there's this, and it's not quite a match to that, but it's pretty close, so I'll, I'll consider it a possible match. I was really kind, okay? But the ones that had no match whatsoever were at, like, David, and then after David is Nathan. I didn't even think he had a son named Nathan. There was a prophet in David's time named Nathan, but I'm pretty sure he didn't have a son named Nathan. Unless it was like by the maid, but then it's never mentioned. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. 34 names out of the 54 names named in Luke's account don't have any match whatsoever, not even close, to any of the names reckoned in Matthew. 34 of them. Which leaves about 20 that are a pretty close match, which aren't in the correct order, and that's, that's under half of the overall names that are given in a very logical, succinct account given by Matthew in the correct order, starting with Abraham, going forward to Yusho, not in the incorrect order, which we never see done in Scripture, where you go back, which is what Luke did, went back, backwards. So things stink. By the time we get to this genealogy in Luke's account, things stink to high heaven. And the only way somebody could be like, well, that's, that's not so bad. I mean, pfft. look, fine. So there's like, there's 16 extra names in there. I mean, uh, how's that? That's not... How's that a big deal? 
So out of the names that, that even kind of match, I, really only enough of a match to be matches to maybe half of what's in Matthew. I don't know, man. Maybe they had like a lot of different names. You know? I mean, even though one-third of all of the names named in Matthew is very clear, concise, organized, and um, following the way that Obery scribes accounted genealogy. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'll ignore that. I'll give him a pass. We, we've got no explanation for it whatsoever. It's massively different. We can't account for any of these names. We can't account for the fact that a third of those names in the one from Matthew, we know were kings that were fathering their, uh, their eldest sons and heirs at an extremely young age. So actually in Luke's account, if it was a different account, if it was, there's like Mary's bloodline, there should actually be less names because of how young these kings in that line were having their children for a full one-third of that entire genealogy. There should be less names if it, was, if it was actually Mary's genealogy, which we never get a, a woman's genealogy. You know who does women's genealogies? You know who accounts their, uh, their seed line through the, uh, the woman's side? I give you three guesses. The first two don't count. And the third one I'm just going to tell you. Our good friends. Our good, good, good friends over there on the east side of the Mediterranean. They do that. Just saying. So, hey, it's at 136.50. I'm going to wrap this one up. And next time I see it, it's, it's going to be Let's Consider Luke, number two. And we, we might complete it in that. We might not. But, hey, this is fun, right? So hopefully I'll see you guys real soon. I'm right in the middle of recording part uh, episode 10 of the Obery Hours, which we do examine Adam A in depth. And it's, it's really, it's very exciting. I'm, I'm having a good time recording it. Hopefully I'll be done with it in the next few days and I'll have another episode of the, the narration of Ancient America to you soon and I will do my best to put out as much material as I can. All your help and support means the world to me. It, it's, uh, it really does. It, it really helps me to do what I do. So thank you so much to all of you who have been so kind and generous. Or the few of you who you've been so faithful and those who, you know, throw some random gifts at me, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So until the next one, everybody take care of yourselves, all right?